Hello aviators, welcome to my instrument rating video series. I'm Ty Jones, your error nerd, bringing you honest experience, reviews, training tips that will help you aviate, navigate, and communicate. Now, if you're new here, the purpose of this video series is to bring you free, in-depth instrument ground school training for you instrument pilots. This is the same exact training and instructions that I normally give to my students. And if you're one of my students that are watching, yes, you can use this as a review because this is literally the same exact instructions that I give in the same exact way. Um, and it has been proven to work. So without further ado, let's jump right into the training. Hey instrument pilots, welcome to session seven for our instrument ground school. Now today, oh, okay, well there's the first, uh, there's the first blooper up today, but anyway, welcome to episode six or session six. Now I know that this one was supposed to be on approach plates, but I kind of felt it was going to be unfair to do this, to do that first before, because we're going to be saying some nomenclatures that you may not be familiar with. Like for example, hey, we're going to shoot this LPV approach. We're going to shoot this RNAV approach. We're going to shoot this VOR approach. But what really is that? So that's what I wanted to dedicate this session to, to go over that first. And then episode seven is going to be the approach plate. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Now there is a lot of acronyms to try to memorize like I said in the earlier videos don't try to memorize anything It's just gonna come naturally. So just let it come naturally What I recommend you do is not try to memorize the acronyms, but know what the acronyms stand for So instead of saying PBN all the time just constantly consciously in your head repeat performance-based navigation performance-based navigation every time you read a uh, an article or anytime you read any kind of study material and it says PBN pronounce it out so performance-based navigation every every single time LPV localize the performance with a vertical guidance and then over time you'll be able to pick that up a lot better than rather than PB what is PBN again VOR RNAV LPV RNP what does all of this stuff mean so just that's my recommendation so before we had GPS and RNAV and the G1000 and our aircraft back in the day we didn't really have all this stuff mainly we just had VORs or NDBs which we don't really use nowadays now that we have GPS right well the FAA is saying hey well since you have GPS we need to, we need to regulate this a little bit you can't just fly anywhere with GPS or you can't just fly any anywhere if you have VOR so what this is is performance based navigation let's say in other words let's say we have two points that we want to fly to. We want to fly to A, or we want to fly from A, correction, to B. And there's different routes that you can fly to, to uh, from A to B. Let's say on this route, you can either fly this route, or you can fly this route. Now, based off of the performance-based navigation systems you have in your aircraft, let's say you have a G1000, then hey, you can fly this route right here because this one has mountains everywhere. It's got mountains over here or whatever, and yeah. So right here, you gotta shoot like an LPV approach or, or, or whatnot if you go this route. Now, if you don't have G1000 or that capability, then what performance-based navigation is saying, well, say, hey, since you have only VORs, it's best to use this route and this route only because you only have VORs. Your perform your, the aircraft's navigational systems does not have the performance-based to shoot this type of navigation from point A to point B. Okay, another term that's underneath PBN or performance-based navigation is required navigational performance, or you may remember it as RNP. But again, re required navigational performance. Now what we're gonna do is talk about the, once you're taking route A or route B, so remember this is P, performance-based navigation, we have route A, to B and we could either take this route or we can take this route, right? So let's say we are taking this route because we have we have our RNAV, we have GPS, and we can actually take this route right here. Now when we do take this route, now we get into required navigational performance. So when we're when we're taking off, we got to take off departure, we got a required navigational performance. So what that is is the CDI deflection when we're in route. We want to be able to, our, our, our aircraft has to be able to tell us if we're at least within two miles of within our, within our course. Uh, so let's say we are right here and we are way out here. Now this is our, our HSI right here, our horizontal situation indicator. And let's say our CDI is way out, way out here. Oh, there it is right there. So if we are in route, then we are at least we're about two miles off course, right? 
Now, once we get a little bit closer to the airport, closer to the destination, then we go into our terminal uh, range, and then the required navigation performance says, that, hey, now with a full scale deflection of your CDI, now you can only be within a one mile off. So let's say we are right here, and then our full scale deflection is now one nautical mile off. And same things for approach. When we're actually finally shooting our approach, coming in on final, we want that CDI to be really, really precise and accurate. In order to do that, we have to meet required navigational performance, RNP. Now, another thing that I did not mention about the um, performance-based navigation, when you're flying these routes from A to B, your navigation performance does need to be at least accurate 95% of your flight time, of the total flight time. If for any reason that there's some kind of failure or your system just for a split second says, hey, I don't know where I'm at right now. I can't really give you accurate, valid information. This system has to be able to tell you. And now if you're flying the G1000, you'll probably notice this by a little LOI for loss of integrity. When you see that, then it probably goes into dead reckoning mode. And if you want a little bit more information on the G1000, I can probably put a video on that. It's gonna be kind of hard to do without the actual G1000 here. Uh, there is a really good G1000 app though. I definitely recommend you download that. If you're an Apple, just just Google or just uh, look in the Apple store for G1000 SIM. And I think it's uh, uh, I think it's like 10 bucks or so, but there's one for the PFD and the MFD. Highly recommend you, uh, you download those. All of this information can be found in the AIM chapter 1-2-1. It goes over uh, uh, performance-based navigation, RNP, everything like that. Like I said before, don't try to memorize this stuff, just know where to find it, know where to reference this stuff. And there's your reference right there uh, in, in the AIM 1-2-1. Uh, now going into WAS. Now I will go into WAS right after this, but before I erase this, you may notice a little dashed line that's going all the way to the center line. What that is, that is with WAS. Now let's say if you don't have WAS, you just have uh, you just have rain. Then your RMP is going to go from in route. Your full scale of flex is going to be two. Then in your terminal it's going to be one, and then your approach is going to be three. Here, here we go. Full scale is going to be, and it's going to stay in this accuracy until you hit the threshold, or actually it's all the way to the runway. Now with Hawass, it's not going to stay at 1.3 for the approach. It's going to slowly keep getting more and more and more and more accurate all the way down to the runway. Now that's Hawass. So. What is WAS and what is RAIN? Okay, so before we get into WAS, Wide Area Augmentation System, what I really want to get over, what I really want to discuss is how the GPS works, what RAIN is, and then we can go from there. So how does GPS work? So I have this little schematic here. Here's our airplane right here. GPS, all it is, is a bunch of clocks. It's literally all it is. The airplane sends the signal to a satellite. The satellite returns that signal back. The airplane times when the speed of light, how much time that takes to, to get that back from that satellite. And then it does the same thing for another satellite and another satellite and another satellite. And it, and it gathers all this information instantaneously in that one second to be able to tell where it's at at that exact point when it received all that information. And then it does it again and again and again and again, continuously does this. So what did I just say? So we have all these satellites right here. I have one satellite, two three, four, and five. So again, when you go to your GPS and you can, especially on the G1000, when you check your RAIM on that RAIM page, you can actually see all the satellites and you can see them moving around. But that's exactly what it's doing. So it's detecting, okay, so I got a satellite here, I got a satellite here, got a satellite here, got a satellite here. So what I wanna do is I wanna shoot out a signal at the speed of light way up here. It's gonna respond and then shoot a signal right back down. It's gonna be able to time that. Now let's say it, it was 0. 0.00000, 000 zero 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 five right it takes that so now it knows how far it is from there at that split second it does the same thing for this one now this one's a little bit further so this one is going to take a little bit longer to get there so this one's zero 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 maybe uh four this one's a look now this one's a lot closer so this one may be zero 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 two and it does this for the, so this one will be really, really far. So you get the point. So that's how it calculates where it's at. It gathers all of these numbers from the distance from each satellite and it calculates its position at that, at that exact precise moment. 
Now guess what? You're flying through the air. So when it does it again, these numbers are no longer going to be accurate because you're not longer here anymore. You're, let's say you're over here. Now it does it again. Now we're a little bit closer to this one. So this is going to be a little bit less number. And then this one's going to be a little less number. This one's going to be a little bit further number. So it constantly calculates this over and over and over and over again, autonomously. Okay. So that's literally how the GPS works. Whether you're in a phone, an airplane, uh, that's literally how it works. Now, now there are, now there is errors that involve this. So this signal, you know, it's the speed of light. It still has to go through a lot of more, a lot more atmosphere to get to, to finally get to the plane. Now this, signal is going to be a lot more accurate because it's right there. It doesn't really, doesn't really have to travel far. However, this one have, might have a little bit of error in it. This one might have a little bit more error than this one does, but all of this errors can actually add up, which is why we have WAS. But before we get into WAS, I really want to get into RAIM really quick. So what RAIM is, let me go over here. So this is how our satellites, um, this is how our airplane can be able to find out where we are in the, where we are um, on the earth, or if it's 2D or 3D. Uh, so we need three satellites in order to get a 2D image. So you can look, you can literally tell where you are at a top down view. However, you can't really see how high you are. That's your third dimensional. So if you want 3D, if you want altitude in there, then you're going to need at least four satellites. Now five, if you have five, then that means you have 4K. So you have, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So what this is, is this is where RAIM comes in. Okay, obviously we don't have 8K here anymore. If you have 8K uh, or, or, one, or G1000, then gee, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's crazy. Anyway, so if you have five, then what RAIM does, so here's five satellites. If, if you have any kind of satellite that kind of drops out, RAIM is gonna say, hey, Lost integrity, there's something wrong, so just beware. I, I can't really guarantee all, all your exact information, but you're down to four satellites. Now, if you have a sixth satellite, then what RAIN does is it takes that sixth satellite and it adds it in to that uh, to that missing satellite that you that you could have had that you could have had. So then you can then you can keep RAIN. Uh, so that's what the six satellites does if you have at least six. If you have rain, you're probably going to have more than enough um, to have that uh, capability for rain. Uh, so again, a re uh, receiver autonomous because it does this autonomously. Integrity monitoring it, it monitors the integrity of all of the GPS signals that you have. If there's something wrong, it's going to be able to identify you. It, it be able to tell you if you have six. Then hey, I don't have five anymore, but I do have a six. So I'm going to take that six one and I'm going to replace it in, um, so I can still have that um, uh, that um, that accuracy there. So that's literally what RAIM is in a nutshell. Okay, so was okay. So going back to the errors in these in these signals, right? Um, so we have in our G1000 for the for your G1000 pilots, you can either have RAIM or was uh, in the auxiliary page you can actually check if you do have rain rain is 100 percent of the time it is going to be available unless you have a gps that's just that's just messed up uh, but most likely you will have rain but why would you want to check rain if your aircraft is capable with watts well what happens if your watts goes out redundancy right so that's one of the reasons why we check uh rain even though we have watts but again what is watts so what watts does is if our aircraft is equipped with watts so let's go ahead and get rid of these really, really quick. Cool. All right, so what this does is the satellites, so here's a ground station right here, right? So this, it receives all of the aired information from all the satellites. And even this one, let's just go down here. And it's gonna get all this random information, like what in the world is going on? I got some cleaning up to do. And that's exactly what this ground station does. Once this actually fixes the, the, the information, it's gonna send this to another ground station where it's gonna actually put it all together, make sense, and it's gonna get rid of all the errors. There's gonna be no question marks. It's gonna take all the question marks out. And again, this is just an analogy. Now uh, it's gonna take all of that out. So, oh, now I can see where we're going at right here. It's ABC, not BAC with all these question marks. So now what it's gonna do is it's, it's gonna take this corrected information. It's gonna send it to an uplink antenna and this is going to send that corrected information. So let's say A, B, C up here. Now this is loaded and this is a geostationary orbit, by the way. So it's not, you look up, it just stays right there. It's so far out in orbit. It actually 
It actually moves with the rotation of the Earth. That's what geostationary orbiting means. But this is going to have the accurate information. So you're not going to be having the, all this erroneous uh, information from these from these low Earth low Earth orbit satellites. Instead, if your aircraft is equipped with WAS, this is how it collects its WAS information. It's going to connect directly to that station. So it's like, hey, I need to get this information over here. I am capable, please send me your accurate information, which it does. And now you have a very, very, very accurate uh, uh, signal. With the rain, your accuracy could maybe be within, let's say, I don't know, uh, 10 meters, for example. I don't know the exact number, but let's say it's 10 meters. With a WAS, that can actually narrow it down to one or two meters. So it's gonna be very, very, very accurate. You need WAS in order to shoot some of these uh, RNF approaches, like for example, LPV. If you don't have WAS and you can't shoot an LPV, it's actually gonna drop down to an LNAV. So and we'll get into that right now. Okay, so now that we understand what WAS is and RAM and how all that good stuff, there's one thing that I did not mention. Some of the, on, on the approach place, you're gonna see what, ha, what they have as uh, LNAV slash VNAV. So what is uh, LNAV slash VNAV? So back in the day, they had these aircraft that had their, their uh, <clears throat> GPS systems that were tied into their barometric system. So what that did is it allowed them to have the uh, glide slope. So that way they can actually shoot uh, approaches that have a glide slope. And that's how they got that. So, you, so you'll see GPS with barrel, that's exactly what that is for. Wasp, we, we, um, we already went over Wasp, so Wasp is like the king of all uh, accuracy when it, when it comes to uh, position uh, and your accuracy is there when it comes to GPS. And then of course we have RAIM right here. This, just consider this like your basic GPS. If you just have RAIM and you're trying to shoot an approach, most likely you're just going to be able to shoot an LNAV approach, which is, li which is uh, a, a navigation with, with lateral guidance. So you only have lateral guidance right here. You don't have a glide slope with the LNAV. Um, so you have LNAV, so what gives it the V in the vertical guidance for the navigation is your barrel. So that's what give, that's what, uh, that's how you get the V there. And then you have LPV, which is a localizer performance with a vertical guidance. A localizer performance, you're shooting your localizer just like, the, just like an ILS, an instrument landing system. Just think of it as the GPS version of an ILS. Now we know that the ILS is a considered a precision approach but lpv even though it has a glide slope and everything like that and it's super accurate some may argue that it's even more accurate than ils's it's still not considered an precision approach according to iCal standards so just keep that in the back of the in the back of the burner in case you're asking also you have your lpv and then you have your lp the lp what that is is if if the FAA deems that, okay, it's, it's good and you're accurate, even though if you have WAS, it's, there's too much obstacles in the way in the, approach plate, in, in the approach path of the runway, maybe there's a tree or an antenna like that, or whatever, so, and we can't really safely guide you down in a nice, even glide slope all the way down. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna change it to an LP approach. So, LNAV. So if you have WAS, you are capable of shooting the LPV and LP approaches. You are capable of shooting the LNAV, VNAV, and the LNAV. Any one you want. Now, when you plug this into your approach uh, plate, whether for your, um, uh, your approach system, whether for using the Garmin 430, the G1000, it's automatically going to choose the best approach that it's capable of shooting. So if you want to shoot the LNAV, it might not be able to do that unless there's some kind of issue with the GPS system. Then it will probably step down to LNAV or LNAV VNAV if you have the barrel system. Otherwise, as may, most likely, most of the time, unless you can have the capability of changing it, it's going to have LPV. Now if you have uh, GPS and barrel, then you can actually shoot both the LNAV uh, the LNAV and LNAV VNAV as well. However, if you just have a RAIM, then you're only going to be able to shoot uh, LNAV. Okay, so now I'm going to go over the last thing in this session, which is the VOR. Now I'm going to try to put myself on the spot and then draw this live, even though I can edit. But I am going to actually try to do this just this honestly. So we got three different ones. Uh, you can actually find this in the AIM. I believe it's 1 uh, 1 8, I believe, I think. Uh, if I'm wrong, I'll put it in the little description below. I'll probably put, I'll probably put the right one on the screen. But anyway, VORs. So let's say our, our VORs right here. And I'm not going to go really into detail about how the VORs and, and, the, and the errors, you know, line of sight and all that good stuff. I'm going to assume that you already know that. If you want me to explain what that is, just put it in the comments below. And I'll put a separate side video for that. Maybe I'll make it session 5.1 or something like that. But anyway, 
Um, so going to the terminal, uh, so your, your, the frequency actually goes like this, looks like a little bubble like this, and it actually is gonna start at 1,000 feet, and all of them are gonna start out like this. So let's go ahead and draw this one, 1,000 feet, and this one is 1,000 feet. So let's see, 1,000, 1,000, and 1,000. This one is gonna, only gonna go up to 12,500 feet. 12,500 and it has a radius of 25 uh, nautical miles. So if you are flying around and you're trying to tune to this VOR, that's a terminal of VOR and you're 30 miles out, well guess what, you may not be able to get that signal. You might just have that flag on your VOR uh, gauge. Now this one, low, this one's gonna go all the way to alpha airspace. I'm gonna draw it at the same height, so, but just know that this is, this just, we're, we zoomed out a little bit, that's all, I guess you can use that as an analogy there. So 18,000, now this radius actually goes out to 40 miles. This next one, this is one of my favorite ones I like to draw, so this one's gonna go up to 14.5, right here. This is also 40 nautical miles, 40 miles, and this is, yeah, a, yeah, 14.5. I'll just write it down here, 14, five, and this is gonna go out from 40 to 100. So I'm gonna draw this out here. This is gonna go to 100 miles, and this is gonna go up to 18 alpha airspace again. Now once it's here, it's gonna whip out again for 130 miles. So I'm gonna whip this out way over here. So from the center, now this is 130 miles. I don't have enough space up here, so I'm gonna write it over here. This goes up to 45, 45,000 feet. And then from 45,000 feet, it goes up another layer, but this one goes back down to 100, um, 100 nautical miles. And then it, it stops at 60,000. 60,000 feet. So why is it really good to know this? Because if you're just flying off of VOR and you're gonna wanna know if, if you're at you know 50 miles and you're at 7,000 feet, are you gonna be able to pick this VOR signal out? Probably not because you're outside of this range. I highly recommend you draw these schematics. If you're not able to draw them, just draw them out over and over and over and over again because it really does help when you're actually flying through the air and, and uh, try and navigate through this um, th through these uh, to the VOR to VOR. So that is the VOR schematic. Okay, I know I said I wasn't gonna do this, but I'll just go ahead and knock this out really quick. The VOR limitations. So first we got zone of confusion. Here's our, uh, our VOR right here, and this is, a, this is a profile view, so we're looking, so this is up, this is going far away, and this is the ground right here. So we're standing right here, yay. Cool, there, there's ourselves. Now, straight up, let's say our airplane is gonna be right over the VOR. Do you really think the airplane is gonna be able to tell exactly where it's at in relation to the VOR if you're right on top of it? No, because what happens is the VOR is gonna send out all these signals out this way, out this way, out this way, out this way. And then it's gonna be like this. So when you're out here, you know you're on this radio, you know you're on this radio, you know what you're on this radio. Now, once these radios start getting closer and closer and closer and closer together, you're gonna have this zone of confusion. Like, what radial am I really on right now? Because I have no idea. Why? Because you're in this zone of confusion. So that's what this is right here, the zone of confusion. Okay, and the next one is gonna be zone of ambiguity. Now what this is, and let's say you're flying, you got your OBS knob set to north, and you're flying to, you got a two indicator in a little window right here, and you're flying this way. Now it knows, it knows that you're flying to the VOR because you got the VOR in front of the airplane. Anywhere in this range, it knows that it's flying to. Now if it's behind it, then it's gonna flip to a from. Now what happens when you're flying right here and right about here? Is it flying to or am I flying from? How's it gonna be able to tell? It really can't because it, it's in the zone of ambiguity. Now if we switched this to west, then it wouldn't be in the zone of ambiguity. You would know exactly that you're going to because it needs to go this way to get to the VOR. Uh, so that's really what that is right there. So let's go back to north 
And again, right around here is gonna be your zone of ambiguity because it doesn't know whether it's going to or from, doesn't really know, doesn't really know. Now that it knows that it's behind it, then you have a from indication. So right in here, you're gonna have that red, that red flag uh, in your VOR in the zone of ambiguity. Okay, and another limitation is the line of sight. So make sure you're in a line of sight because it's a VHF antenna, uh, very high frequency, and you're definitely gonna need uh, to be in line of sight because they just they just travel in a straight line for, for VHF. Uh, one last thing I wanna go to about uh, the VORs, is, so you gotta check the VORs every 30 days. Now, how do we check that? The to and from indicator, does it have to be from 180 or 3602 or plus or minus four? Like what? What, how do you, what, how, what, what, So I have a really good tool to help you memorize that. So let's say we're flying, we're flying along, flying along, yay, obviously, and we drop something out of our window from here, all right? Now, due to gravity, where is it gonna go? It's gonna go down, right? So it's going to go down, it's going to fall from the sky, from the sky, and it's going to go to the ground, right? So to the ground. All right, now let's put a heading indicator right on here. So let's put a heading indicator. And then we got our north, south, west, east. Now what heading is north? 360, right? So 360, what heading is south? You see where I'm getting at here, right? So 180. So when you're doing your, when you're doing your VOT checks, make sure that you have a two indicator when you have when you're setting it to 180 and then if you're going to from it's going to be a 360 so that's just a silly thing that helped me remember